Thank you so much for joining us at LifePoint Church Online. If God is using this ministry to impact your life, we would love to hear about it and encourage you to share your story at lifepoint.org forward slash story. If you'd like to partner with us financially and help expand our reach all over the world with the good news of Jesus, you can do so by clicking the Give button at the bottom of the page and selecting the option that works best for you. Or you can use our text to give option by texting the keyword life point and the amount to the number 45777. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you are encouraged by today's message. I'm bringing a message today entitled, Perception is Not reality. Perception is not reality. Most of us have probably heard the phrase perception is reality. You've probably heard that. And there's no doubt that perception is a very powerful thing. It's a powerful force and um, it can influence us greatly. And in fact, there have been scientific studies done on the power of perception in our lives. And I came across one I wanted to share with you today because I found just it a little bit astounding. Um, there was this group of researchers that um, took some elementary school age kids and they did just a basic IQ test for their age and tested all the children and they all tested out about the same, where they should be for that age. Well, then um, they told the teachers that there was a group of students that tested in the top 20% of this, what they called early bloomers test, that they were ready to really learn this year, that they had a, a greater aptitude from learning than all the other kids. Well, the truth was that was a big lie. Um, they just randomly selected the kids, but they told the teacher, these certain kids, man, they're set to bloom this year. Well, they left the teachers go and just did their normal school year. And at the end of the school year, um, they went back and they gave all the children the same intelligence test. And you know what they found was fascinating. Those randomly selected students did better than everybody else. In fact, they scored 10 to 15 IQ points higher than their peers. And the only different factor was they had given the teachers a perception of this, these students, that this was the year that they were ready to learn. And so how the teachers perceived these students changed how they approached them, changed how they saw them, and how they interacted with them. Perception is a powerful thing. I wonder if you've ever thought about how you perceive God. Another way you could say that is, have you ever thought about how you see God? Like, how do you see him? Have you ever thought about that? Because perception is a powerful thing. And I think how you see God, your perception of him, it's going to affect how you approach him and what you will expect from him. If you see him as far off and uncaring, if you see him as some like cosmic force that has no care in the details of your life, then when you're facing trouble, you're not going to go to him. Um, if you see God as angry and unjust, then when you are in your moments of shame, you're going to hide from him instead of running to him. Wow. Right? How you see God, how you see God is greatly dependent on how you approach him. You know, I, I said, you, some of you are looking at me like, um, okay, you told me perception is not reality, and you've just spent these last few minutes telling me how powerful perception is. And let me tell you why I'm saying today perception is not reality. And that's because perception is the lens through which we see reality. But reality is the true state of something. What I mean by that is your perception is how you see the object, but it doesn't change what the object is. The object is what it is. Your perception is how you see it. So I'm going to kind of bring to us today that God is who he is. But our perception, how we see him, that lens that we look through, can change how we approach him. I don't know, um, for me personally, I don't know how you've seen God up to this point, but for me personally, maybe you were like me, I grew up seeing God um, as a righteous judge. Like, I grew up in church, and there are many blessings associated with that, but some of the legalistic framework I grew up in, I had a perception of God, a view of God. I saw God as someone who was was righteous and holy, but could care less about the details of my life. Certainly is not something that I would bring my, my troubles to, my struggles to. And, and like, it changed how I interacted with him. 
And then something happened along the journey of my walk is my lens got readjusted. And I want to talk to you today about an aspect of God that when I saw him this way, it changed so much for me, so much for me. And that's to be able to see God as friend. And I don't know if you've ever thought of God as your friend, but I want to show you today that God is your friend. And in fact, he is the very best friend that you could ever have. And if you can refocus your filter to see him that way, I really believe it's going to change your life for the better. Um, it radically has changed mine to see him that way. I am, um, in preparing for this message, I did some studies and research about what are some things that make up a good friend. Like, what are the qualities of a good friend? And there is a ton of stuff out there. And um, I kind of boiled it down to the five things that were pretty consistent across lots of studies and research. And I want to walk you through those five things and how I believe that God is the fulfillment of those things in our life. We're going to walk through that together, and hopefully we're going to end with you seeing God a little differently than when you came in today. Uh, the first characteristic um, that's pretty universal about what makes a good friend is that they would be trustworthy, that they would be trustworthy. And trustworthy is able to be relied on as honest or truthful, dependable, honorable, and man, I love this last part. As good as one's word. As good as one's word. You know, personally, when you say trustworthy, the friend that comes to mind is my friend Tasia. Yes, that's her name, Tasia. Um, her parents wanted a unique name, so they put a T in front of Asia, and she became Tasia. But um, <laughs> never gets spelled right by anybody, but it's okay. Um, she, when I think of trustworthy, when I think of dependable, I get a picture in my mind of Tasia DeWitt. Um, she is the kind of person that will bend herself over backwards to keep a commitment, to do what she said that she's going to do. Um, she's really, in my mind, a vault locked down. Like, she's a kind of person your secrets are safe with. How I many you know, you know you need those kind of people? Um, have you heard that sailing, saying that um, loose lips sink ships? You guys have heard that? Well, um, Tasia's ship is still sailing strong, okay? Um, she is just so trustworthy and so dependable, and I'm so thankful for her. But the truth is, as dependable and as honest and as reliable as Tasia is, the truth is, Tasia's told a lie. Like, she's not told the truth 100% of the times. But I do have a friend who's never told a lie, who's always been faithful, who's always been true, who can always be taken at his word, and that friend is Jesus. Psalms 9.10 says, those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never. That word in the original language means never. Forsaken those who seek you. Never. There's never been a time when God didn't do what he said he was going to do. Psalms 22, 4 through 5. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and they were not put to shame. I love that because you know what that's saying? Is that like putting your trust in God, you're never going to be left embarrassed. Have you ever put your trust in someone and then been disappointed, been let down? And here's the thing. That happens because not because people are horrible, but because they're human. People are human. But God will never put you to shame. You can always put your trust in him. And so we need friends like my friend Tasia. We do. You need those people in your life. But if you're looking for a friend, I want you to see God as someone that you can always trust. He is trustworthy every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Um, Psalm 33, 4, for the word of the Lord is right and true. Remember, part of the definition was as good as one's word. His word is right and true. He is faithful in all that he does and everything he does. The next characteristic um, that across the board people indicated that made a good friend is that they would be loyal. They would be loyal. Loyal is giving or showing firm and consistent support or allegiance, faithful, devoted. We need some loyal friends. You know what a loyal friend is? A loyal friend is the person 
that has seen you at your worst and still wants to be your friend, <laughs> right? <laughs> seen you at your worst. And when, personally, when I think of a loyal friend, I think of my cousin Daniel. And he's gone on to be with the Lord now, but when we were growing up, we were close in age, we were kind of thick as thieves, we were best friends growing up. And let me tell you, he was loyal. Like when you were his friend, he was devoted to you. Good times, bad times, he was devoted. And I think of a particular incident. Anybody in the house ever just blown it? Like, like just blown it. And you look back and you're like, um so embarrassed. Like, I've lost my mind. Okay, I had one of those moments in my early 20s. Um, Daniel and I got in disagreement, and I took the way low road, (laughs) Um, and I just made a tail out of myself and did not handle myself well, and looking back on it was, like, so ashamed of how I handled that disagreement. And how many of you know that for a lot of people, when you have that kind of interaction and you've really messed up, Um, they just kind of don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. Or best case, there's some distance in the relationship. That wasn't Daniel. He was loyal. Because it wasn't long after that that I had, like, one of my greatest victories in life, like my mountaintop moment. And do you know he was the first person to call me? First person to call me and to congratulate me. He was was loyal. But can I tell you the truth about that situation is that as loyal as Daniel was, as devoted as he was to our friendship, he was also the person that caused me the greatest um, heartache. Um, the, The feeling of the greatest betrayal in my life came from him. Again, not, not because he's evil, because he's human, but there is a friend that I have that has never let me down, has always been committed and faithful to me in every season. In Proverbs 18, 24, it says, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You know, there's a saying that blood is thicker than water. I'm going to tell you that's true. And I know that because of a bloody cross. Blood is thicker than water, okay? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was praying over what he was about to do to go to the cross, and he's asking the Father if there's any other way, and the weight of that is sitting on him to the point that he is sweating blood. I don't know if you've ever carried anything weighty to the point that you're sweating blood, but that's the place Jesus was in. And when the Father said, nope, this is the only way This is the only way to correct this sin problem is you've got to go to the cross. Jesus' devotion to me was he went. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Blood is thicker than water. And and the the truth is um, that Daniel was a great friend and he was devoted to me, but he was not committed to me the way that my best friend Jesus is committed to me. Psalms 36.5 says, your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. It, it is incomprehensible how faithful God is to us. Lamentations 3.22 through 23, the steadfast, I love that, steadfast, the steady love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Jesus is the most faithful, loyal friend you will ever have. And if you put your faith in him, he will never, ever leave you. Never. The next quality is supportive. Um, You need friends like this. Supportive is providing encouragement or emotional help, caring, understanding, kind. You know, when I think of supporting uh, friends, friends that are supportive, um, the name that immediately comes to mind is my sister, Laura. And um, she's my sister, but she's also my, one of my best friends in life. And uh, if you know her, you would agree with me. There is uh, no one who is more um, committed to being there and being um, with you through every trial and season And I think of a particular incident when I think of this idea of supportive. When I um, was in my senior year of college, I got extremely ill, like very, very sick. 
And one of the um, kind of side issues with the illness was I started to lose my hair. And, you know, we like to think that it's just hair and I wouldn't be so vain. But the truth is, when you're, like, in college, I think even now, like, your hair starts falling out. It's hard. It's a little devastating. And at the worst part of it, I had a bald spot about that big on the back of my head. And um, I remember coming home from the doctor um, after seeing a specialist. I got sent to a specialist, and he was so encouraging because he basically said um, it could get better with treatment. It could take exactly the same, and you never regrow that spot. Or it could just all fall out, and you'll be bald for the rest of your life. And I thought, well, thanks for that. Um, <laughs> it's very encouraging. So um, I remember going home and sitting on my bed and, and just crying over it, just feeling so distraught over the lack of certainty of how this issue is going to work out. And my sister comes down, and she puts her arm around me, and I tell her what's happened. And um, she looked me dead in the eye, and she said, if all your hair falls out... I will shave my head bald, and we'll go wig shopping. Now, here's the thing. She meant it. Like, she meant it. You need those kind of people. Those, those kind of friends don't come along every day. Um, you, you can't buy that kind of friendship that, that means it. A lot of people will say that to you, but the person who would take the buzzer to their head and go wig shopping with you, that's a treasure, right? The most supportive friend I've ever had in my life in her but the truth is, in my darkest moment, in my deepest depression, when I stood in my bathroom and contemplated suicide, because I thought there was no hope, she couldn't be the support I needed. There was only one friend who could pierce through all of that darkness and speak my name and bring light, and that friend is Jesus. His word says in Psalm 9:9, the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. A refuge. You, you need some supporting friends in your life, but can I tell you, they can't be a refuge for you. You need someone else. You need someone higher, someone greater, who is above all supreme. You need God as a refuge, a stronghold in times of trouble. I love the picture that paints, that whatever storm that you're facing, whatever's knocking you about in life, that God wants to be the kind of friend that you can run to and you can find shelter and safety in through every storm. He wants to be that kind of friend for you. Psalm 28, 7 says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. He's your shield. Do you know that um, if you follow after God, the enemy just wants to come after you. And there are days you're going to feel like you are completely under attack. Maybe today is one of those days for you. And God wants to be the kind of friend that is your shield. He'll be your front guard and your rear guard. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. He wants to help you. I don't know how you've perceived God up to this point, but I want you to know today, he wants to be a stronghold for you. He wants to support you in times of trouble. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says, come to me, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. Ever carried a heavy weight? Ever feel beat up by life? Think you can't go on? Ever feel like, you know, um, the world and life is above your head and you're barely getting your head up to get a breath? I know I've felt that way at times. Listen. Jesus is inviting you to come to him. He says, if you'll come to me with all that heavy stuff, I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. That's the kind of friend he wants to be in your life. He wants to bring you rest. Next is challenging, and not to, you know, be too tongue-in-cheek. Uh, this is probably going to be the most challenging point because um, we need this in friendship, we, we need this, but we don't always like it. Um, challenging is an invitation to do something that one thinks will be difficult or impossible, tests or calls out. So we need friends. And let me say as a side note, um, if you've only surrounded yourself with people who just tell you that you're awesome all the time, <laughs> you need a new circle. And, and this can be difficult because we live in a world that gets a friend 
and loses a friend with a click of a button. And so we've kind of lost the art of friendship. But you need people in your life who will challenge you, that sometimes will see potential in you, that you don't see in yourself and will call it out. And you need people that see your junk and will call you on it. We'll, we'll see you n- making a wrong choice and we'll say, hey, 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 don't go that way. You, we need these kind of friends in our life. And for me, I think um, when I think of someone who has done this for me in my life, I think of my Uncle Gary. And um, if you know anything about my story, um, when I was 16, my best friend was murdered. She was murdered by a serial killer. It was awful. And um, I entered um, a state of just depression and then anger. If you know the five stages of grief, I got really stuck on anger. I just sort of lived and camped out in anger and um, got very bitter and self-righteous. And like, just as a side note, if you ever think that you can contain anger and bitterness to like one part of your life, it's a lie from the pit of hell. It will affect everything. And so Anger and bitterness I thought was I was directing at the one man who had murdered my friend. Really, that just started to bleed into every area of my life. And I was like just an angry, bitter person. That's like who I was. And I can remember once just my uncle and I um, happened to be over at his house. He, we were making lunch. I think we were making sandwiches. And um, we had been talking a little bit about her case. And um, he looked at me and with honestly, so much kindness and gentleness. He like braved the beast of the subject. <laughs> and um, he said to me, he's like, you know, have you, have you ever thought um, that this man might place his faith in Jesus and get saved? Like, he may be in heaven with us. Y'all, the, you know, they say if, they, if someone bumps your cup, what spills over is what inside? Well, he bumped my cup, and what spilled over was rage. <laughs> I was so angry at that thought. I mean, I, I remember getting so mad at him and being like, this person, this human, will never, ever share space with me in heaven. Like, this whole God died for the whole world mess was everyone but him. Like, grace stops at his door. And my uncle in love just looked at me, and he said, you know, you got to pray through that. Like, you're, you, you really do. You have to pray through that. And I was not happy. I left mad, but, um, you know, the Lord started to work something on me. And in Scripture, Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. I, I needed someone who was willing to sharpen me a little bit, willing to rub me a little bit, you know, that we could have left it you know, comfortable and stayed back, but I needed someone who would help sharpen the edges. Proverbs 13, 20 says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. It hurt what he said. It hurt, but I needed it and I could trust it. It was faithful because I knew he was for me. And, and so like I began to pray and struggle through that. But the truth is, the reality was that while my Uncle Gary could be the kind of friend who would point that out, brave my anger, brave that kind of stuff spewing back to to get me to pray and look at what was going on in my heart. He had no power to help me do what honestly felt impossible. It felt impossible to forgive someone because that's really the root of my anger was I was harboring unforgiveness. It felt impossible to forgive someone who had murdered a person who was so close to me, felt like a sister to me. It felt impossible. And so my friendship with my uncle was important, but it only took me so far. But you know, I have a friend, and his name is Jesus. And scripture tells me in Philippians 4.13 that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, I... (laughs) Pastor talked about a few weeks ago, this verse is like, you see it on running t-shirts, right? Um, And that's great and all. But really, this verse means something. This became my life verse in this season. You want to know why? Because this all things stuff, this all things, I needed it to do something that felt impossible. Like you you need friends in your life who will challenge you, who will call the best out of you, who will help you maybe see blind spots in your life. 
but human friendships can only take you so far. And for me to actually do the work of forgiving, I needed the power of a friend who could change my heart. And there's only one friend who can change your heart. There's only one who can help you do what feels impossible, that give you the power to do the thing that you think you absolutely can't do, that can not only challenge you to it, but can give you the strength to see it through. And that friend is Jesus. So maybe you haven't seen him that way. Maybe you haven't perceived God as a friend who can give you the power and the strength to do the things in your life that you think you can't do. I'm here to tell you firsthand, he is, and he can, and he will, he will. The last point is loving. You need friends that are loving. This is showing love, it's demonstrative. Serving as conclusive evidence of something, giving proof. I love that, conclusive evidence. Do you know love isn't love until you show it? You can say all day you love me, but until you show it, it's not real. Because perception is not reality. It's just the lens through which we see. You know, I think about loving, a friend who's loving. I think of my, my very best friend, um, and that's my husband, Willie. Uh, he loves me at all times. And there's a scripture that talks about this. Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend loves at all times. He and I have been married for 12 years, we've been together for 15, and we've lived through a lot of junk together. Um, we've, we've been through some just mountaintop, celebrate, kind of call heaven down kind of moments. And we've been through some dark, dark valley moments that you kind of just want to forget and file away. I have attended more funerals with this man than weddings. In fact, we had one year we went to 13 funerals in one year. We've lived through some life together and he loves me at all times. He's seen me at my absolute worst and he's seen me at my absolute best and he loves me the same all the time. You, you need people, you need friends who will love you, love you at all times. But you know, um, the truth is, Willie would absolutely, without hesitation, die for me, without a thought. He would lay his life down for me and our kids. But he can't die for me in the way that I need it on the deepest level. His death can't do for me on the deepest level what I need done, because Willie and I had the same problem, and it's called sin. This, this thing, sin, missing the mark, separated me from the Father. And while Willie loves me and would die for me, he can't die for me in the way I needed it. But there is a friend that I have. His name is Jesus. And John 15 says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Can I tell you, you have a friend and his name is Jesus. And he did for you 2,000 years ago what you could not do for yourself. And he laid down his life to make a way where you couldn't make a way so that you could come back into relationship with the Father. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates, shows conclusively, gives you proof of his love in that while we were still sinners, while I was still in my mess, while you were still in your, your mess, I want you to think about the worst thing that you've ever done in life. And in the midst of doing that, God demonstrated his love for you and that Christ died for you. You've got a friend who wants to stick closer than a brother. You've got a friend that has already laid his life down for you to make a way for you because he wants to be in relationship with you. And so I don't know how you have seen God up to this point, 
Maybe you haven't seen him at all. But I want to challenge you today to maybe adjust your lens, to see God as your friend. Can I tell you, this changed everything for me. It changed everything. I read scripture differently now because I see him as my friend. And if I had one prayer for you today, it's that if you haven't seen God as your friend up to this point, that you would, that you would see him as friend. And if you've never placed your faith in Christ, I pray that today is the day that you do that. And I wanna help you with that, I do. If everyone would bow their heads and close their eyes, no one looking around. You know, I, um, I told you about a lot of friends and they all have a lot of friendship qualities that they excel at. But there is only one person who can fulfill all of these things only Jesus can be all of those things in your life all of the time. He wants to be the greatest friend that you have ever known. But the truth is he's a gentleman and he would never force himself on you. Never. It's not in his nature. And so he puts it in your hands to choose whether or not you want friendship with him. He desperately wants it with you. He died so that he could be your friend. But if you're ready today to take him up on that offer, I want to help you. I want to lead you in a prayer with no one looking around. There's nothing magical about this prayer. You have to mean the words by faith. It is by grace you are saved through faith. But if you mean the words, he wants to meet you here today and he wants to save you. And so for the benefit of everyone who may be praying this for the first time, I'm going to ask that everyone repeat after me. Dear God, I need you. Jesus, I need you to save me. I ask you to forgive me for all of my sin. And I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. I give you my life. I give you control. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me today. With all heads bowed and eyes still closed, I'm just gonna ask one thing. If you prayed that prayer to ask Jesus to be your best friend, to come in and be Savior and Lord of your life, would you just do me the honor so I can pray over you? Would you raise your hand? God, I see you. I see you, praise God. Every eye is closed, let me just pray a blessing over you. Lord, bless every person who just made the decision to place their faith and their trust in you. God, they've made the best decision that they'll ever make in their life. There is no greater friend than our friend Jesus. Protect them, give them the courage to follow hard after you in the coming weeks and months. And it's in your precious name we pray, amen. LifePoint Church, can we celebrate everyone who just placed their faith in Christ?